Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this incredible day. And Lord, we thank you for your word. It is living. It is active. It is true. It is like fire. It is like a hammer. And it is sharper than any double-edged sword. So Holy Spirit, speak to us through your word. Bring encouragement, strength, comfort, conviction. Father, radically transform us that we would see that out of these Ten Commandments, there's really two. It's to love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul. And it's to love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus, show us the way because you are the way. And we ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, for those who I have not met, my name is Doug Jones. And I am the campus teaching pastor here, and I just want to welcome each and every one of you to here at the Church of Woodbine for those worshiping online. For those in the balcony, welcome. We have not had that many people in the balcony for a while, so glad to see the balcony filling back up a little bit. But I'm so glad that you guys are here. Before we dive into this passage, I've got two, three uh, pastor privilege announcements I want to make. One is actually really funny. It's really cool. But the first one's this. The deacons and I have been talking about having a men's breakfast on September 10th. So there's going to be some more information kind of rolling out. It's a Saturday morning, so the deacons would love to have a men's breakfast on September 10th. So that's the first one. The second one is freedom prayer. Uh, We've been talking a lot about freedom prayer the past several weeks. And this coming Friday and all day Saturday is a freedom prayer conference. Uh, Several, Almost 60 people have signed up. Uh, So we would love to have you guys sign up, but it's a conference giving us tools, very practical tools on how to walk with in greater freedom with Jesus, learning to hear his voice and to walk in freedom. You guys know the story of the parable about the parable of the paralytic who he had four friends bring him to the feet of Jesus. All of us are like that paralytic. All of us are just like those friends. Where there are times when we need others to carry us and to pull the debris away of the roof that's keeping us from Jesus to get to Jesus' feet so that he can bring us into greater freedom as he promises in his word. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So all of us are just like that paralytic. And also all of us are like those four friends where we need to carry our friends, our brothers and sisters in Jesus to the feet of Jesus so that they can hear from him. And this Freedom Prayer Conference will teach us and equip us how to do that. So if you haven't signed up, you can, we've got two signs here, Snap Frames Plus here. There's a QR code. You can go to our website and sign up. Uh, there is a cost. If cost is an impediment to you, please let me know. And maybe you'll get a pastor privilege pass. So we'll see. So the last one is this. About a month ago, as we were going through our summer series on First Thessalonians, we were talking about one of the Sundays about honoring those in leadership, submitting to those in leadership here at the church. And I mentioned to you guys that uh, there is a dear family with a bunch of little kids that used to worship here. They've moved away. And the husband and wife, I think it was the wife, about every other month would make me a bunch of chocolate chip cookies. And it would encourage me so much. And my little brother, he, his name is Stephen Jones. We call him Stevie. Uh, He worships with us online. Hi, Stevie. And right after that sermon, he said, I'm sending you cookies right away. And this past week, there was a box that came into our house. It was about this big. And it was chuck full of what my other brothers and I call Stevie cookies. So if you see me gain weight over the next month, uh, that, and it just touched me dearly. So, I mean, simple, practical ways. But um, if you want some Stevie cookies, let me know. We'll see if he can make more batches of them. Maybe I'll bring some next week. So it's basically cookies of a kitchen sink. They're awesome. So anyway, how to love and serve those who lead us and shepherd us. There's very simple, practical ways. So I don't want all y'all making me cookies for next week, please. So anyway, so anyway. Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments. If you want to open your Bibles back to Deuteronomy chapter 5, we're going to look at these Ten Commandments. And uh, before we get started, um, there is a slide I'd love to show you just about the Ten Commandments. Do you really know them? And uh, did you know that the Ten Commandments, uh, Gallup did a poll, and it says the majority of Americans, the Ten Commandments, are not set in stone the way the original Ten Commandments were set in stone. As you'll see here, 60% of Americans cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. 
74% of Americans can name all three stooges, Mo, Larry, and Curly. 35% of Americans can recall all six kids from the Brady Bunch. And 25% of Americans can name all seven ingredients of a McDonald's Big Mac. But here's the kicker. Only 14% can accurately name all Ten Commandments. Yet 78% of Americans want them in our public displays. We might want them on our public government buildings or in our schools. But are they written in our hearts? And when I mean written in our hearts, we naturally live them out. It's an overflow of our love relationship with Jesus. Where are we? I've got a great story to share with you. 23 years ago, I was in Mexico. I'd been in Mexico for almost four years. My wife, Christy, at the time, we were not married. We weren't even dating. We weren't even a thing or an item. We went to the same college. We knew each other. Her, one of my best friends was her roommate. One of my roommates was one of her best friends. I was too afraid of Christy. She was way too beautiful for me. I definitely outkicked my coverage. Okay, I married up. So I don't know how I convinced her. But after, three, four, after four years in Mexico, she came up to visit to see what we were doing, our mission. And we really hit it off. And I was nervous as a cat in an alley with five dogs. And she came up, and it was just awesome. And I swept her off her feet. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> you notice she's not here today. No, I, she's not here today. But we really hit it off, and she loved what we were doing. And the last night she was there, I actually I said, hey, do you think there's more just between this visit and relationship? Like, do you think there could be something more than that? Which was very uncommon for me. But I had gotten enough freedom, prayer, and healing where I wasn't afraid of intimacy. And she said, yes. And then she reached into her purse and she pulled out this huge scroll. And she says, but before we continue, there are 10 regulations that you need to fulfill to the T. And then there's another 603 regulations that my parents are going to give you that you need to completely obey. And on top of that, there's another 1,000 familial traditions that you need to keep. And if you obey... Every single one of those commandments and regulations, we might be able to date. 23 years later. Now, I hope you hear the sarcasm in that. I hope that you understand that that is not what Christie said. And my hope is, and my prayer for all of us, is that we would truly understand that God is not a God who pulls out this huge clipboard or this huge scroll and says, you need to obey me in this, 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 and this. And if you do that fully 100%, then I might love you. You see, unfortunately, as Christians, we see God as this big, angry ogre, and there's this huge to-do list, and there's tons of commandments in the Old Testament. There's actually 613. And these 10, which are part of the covenant, these 10 were given on Mount Sinai, on Mount Horeb. And unfortunately, throughout centuries of both Judaism and then with Christianity, most of us become legalists. And we have this list of rules. They might be the Ten Commandments, or they might be another list of a whole lot of traditional rules. Read your Bible, don't drink, don't smoke, you can't go to dances, you can't wear pants, you can't wear skirts, you can't do this, you can't do this. And it's this huge list. And we have this sense inside of us that, man, I'm just not, I'm not adding up, I'm not adding up. And I can remember in Mexico and even here, sometimes people would hyper-focus on, I'll just say it, not smoking. And yet they were some of the most kind, generous, Christ-like people I'd ever met. Jesus judges the heart. And we're going to look at it today. Jesus judges the heart and he said numerous times you've heard it said do not murder but I tell you if you curse someone you've already committed murder it's out of the heart and too much of the time with the ten commandments and all these other commandments and then the hundreds of traditional churchy regulations that we can put on people 
we create walls and barriers and slam doors in front of people's faces thinking that they've got to fulfill all of these things in order to measure up to God's standard, to be loved and accepted. It's as crazy as the story I shared with you about starting my dating relationship with Christy. What type of friendships do we have where we want to be friends with somebody, they roll out this huge scroll with hundreds of rules and regulations and say, if you follow all these, I'll be your friend. There's not a single friendship we have that works that way. So why do we do it to God? Why do we do it to him? Right here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 1, this is what Moses says. And let's stand up. We're getting way too relaxed in our pews. Let's stand up. We're going to read verse 1 through 5. This is God's word for God's people. This is what Moses wrote thousands of years ago to his people, to us. Moses commanded all Israel and said to them, Israel, listen to the statutes and to the ordinances. I'm proclaiming as you hear them today. Learn and follow them carefully. The Lord our God, he made a covenant with us at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face from the fire on the mountain. At that time, I was standing between the Lord and you to report the word of the Lord to you because you were afraid of the fire and you did not go up the mountain. And he said, and we may be seated. A little bit of context. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God, when he pulled Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he pulled them out and they marched up to the Red Sea and he opened the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground and he rescued them from the armies of Pharaoh. Three months later at Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, they came to the mountain, and it's what Moses is describing right here. But see, by the time Moses wrote Deuteronomy, 40 years had passed, a whole generation. And they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write these five books of the Bible. And Deuteronomy was written almost in one sitting, is what many theologians think, in that it was an actual speech, a sermon. It's a long sermon. And it's the next generation of Israelites who are going to go into the promised land. And Moses is going to die. God has already told him, and Moses has already told the people, I'm not leading you into Israel, into the promised land. Joshua is. But I'm going to download to you what God has already shown us and told us and spoke to us about. And look at right here, here in verse 1, he he summons all of Israel, not just some of Israel, all. Say all. All All of Israel. And he says, listen. And it's not a coincidence. It's not a diocidencia. That in almost every passage we've looked at here in Deuteronomy, that we see, hear, O Israel, listen. And I'll say it again, how many of us are so quick to speak and slow to listen? And yet we're commanded to be quick to listen, slow to speak. We've been given two ears and how many mouths? Two ears and one mouth. And yet we act as if we have ten mouths and no ears. And yet Moses is commanding his people to listen. And then he says, be very careful to follow and obey these commandments I'm giving you. Sounds like legalism, Doug. It's not what you said earlier. Maybe. We are to follow closely the commandments of the Lord. We're to learn them. We're to study them, to meditate on them. But we need to know the heart that's behind and that undergirds and that these commandments flow out of. We need to learn them. And then he says... God spoke to you. Moses tells the Israelites, the next generation. They were little kids or not even born yet when this event happened. When God gave the covenant, when he gave and affirmed that covenant and gave the Ten Commandments. The adults at this time were little kids like Ezra and Elias, but they weren't even born yet. He says, God spoke to you face to face. You see, there's this covenant family that God has made. And the covenant of Israel, it's not just with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's not with Joseph and his brothers, but it's with all the descendants. And throughout the entire Old Testament, God was reaffirming time after time with every generation. His covenant with his people. Yes, the generations passed by. 
but God still speaks face to face. And Moses is encouraging his people. God spoke to you face to face. And he says, you were scared. And if you go back in Exodus and read the the original event, it was scary. God descended upon Mount Sinai. And there was lightning and thunder and dark smoke. And the entire mountain shook. And the people were so afraid. They told Moses, you go up. God even told Moses, tell the people not to even touch the mountain or they'll die. Because see, God is so amazingly awesome and holy that no one can see his face and live. And Moses did stand in that breach. And God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and then Moses gave them to his people. And Moses is reminding the people of Israel because Moses knows, and we've seen it last week and the week before, they're going to go into the promised land and they'll be confronted by armies and nations and giants and trials and tribulations and battles. And if they're not deeply rooted into the love of God, if they don't know who God is, they will lose their way. And so God is downloading through the power of Holy Spirit through Moses, reminding them, this is my covenant. And then we have, starting in chapter and verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6, 6 through 21, we have the Ten Commandments. And we could go line by line and we could go verse by verse. But basically, these Ten Commandments are divided into two categories. Say two. Two. Comes right before three. Jesus gave us two commandments, the greatest commandments. And see, in these categories, the first category of these Ten Commandments deals with our relationship with God. It's commandment one through four. In the first commandment, we'll see it. God says, you'll have no other gods before me. That's commandment one. And then he says, do not make any idols for yourself. Do not bow down. It's like four commandments in one. Somehow God does that. So are these the 14 commandments? No, there are ten, but there's really two. You have no other God before me. Make no idols for yourself. Do not bow down to them. Do not worship them. You see, God longs and he desires to rule the hearts of men and women, to take first priority and the only priority. And you know what? God deserves it and he demands it. And he doesn't and he shouldn't have to earn it in our hearts. He's created everything. He is everything. He is life himself. He's alpha and omega. He's beginning. He is end. He holds life in the palm of his hands. And he's created all things. And he's worthy. He sits on the throne of heaven. And he longs to sit on the throne of every heart and mind of everyone who lives. Make no idols. Don't serve them. Don't bow down to them. Don't fear them. And then he talks about Don't take the Lord's name in vain. The the name in the Old Testament, the name meant the person. Our words here in North America mean nothing. We say we'll do it and we don't. Words have great power. And yet we as North Americans, as Westerners, we've thrown that power out. But in the Old Testament, someone's name meant their personhood, their character. So using the Lord's name in vain is not just a cuss word, which is one of the most popular cuss words today. Everyone says it, and we don't even bat an eye. Could you imagine someone using your mother's name as a curse word, as a word of disgust, anger, and yet we do it to the Lord every day? But it meant so much more than that. Don't make promises and vows to the Lord that you don't plan on keeping. But don't dishonor the Lord. Don't dishonor his personhood and his character and who he is because he's so worthy and holy. And then the fourth commandment is to honor the Sabbath. And God goes in this huge explanation in verse 12 and 13 and 14 about reminding them, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. But here with me, I've given you a day of rest. Everyone needs to rest. Everyone needs to take a day off from their normal work routine activities. And we see the life of Jesus. He was always breaking the Sabbath. And so the traditions of men and women, not only of the Old Testament, but maybe even of us as Christians, maybe we've got this Sabbath thing all wrong. 
Sabbath is rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. And he says the Sabbath was created for you. It's not this huge list of legalistic do's and don'ts that the Jewish leaders had put upon the Jewish people. But it was an incredible day to rest, to worship, to take time off. The first four commandments, it's all about our love relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's what God was trying to download to, it, download to Israel. But I'll tell you what, it is so much easier to follow a list of rules than it is to follow a person. If we follow a list of rules, it makes us feel better about ourselves if we do it. And if we don't follow that list of rules, it makes us even feel more guilty. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. No longer to be yoked to a yoke of slavery, nor this legalism that is so hard. And so that's why when the professor, professor, oh, my Spanish, when the religious leaders and the lawyer, when they came to Jesus, the teacher of the law said, teacher, and they did it in a very snarky, prideful, arrogant way, which of the commandments is most important? And he says, and it's the Shema, and we'll say it here in a minute, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the greatest of all the commandments. The second half of these Ten Commandments basically revolve around our relationship with others. Jesus himself said, and you guys know, you know the commandments. You know, don't murder. Honor your father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't lie. Six commandments. And they all revolve around that second great commandment, which comes from Leviticus. Love others as yourself. If you, we look at these commandments of don't, you know, of honoring your mother and father, of don't commit murder, don't commit adultery. Jesus expounded on those commandments. And he is very clear. And I said it earlier. Jesus says, you've heard it written, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if anyone looks at a woman lustfully, he's already committed adultery in his heart. You see, God is not this police officer with this huge clipboard. All right, Adam, that's why you didn't do that, and you didn't do that, and no, you didn't do that, and no, Adam, you didn't do that. That's not how relationships work. God wants to win our hearts and our passions, and he knows that out of the flow of our heart will come what? Well, if we don't have Jesus, it will be murder and strife and adultery and lies and deceit. That's why Jesus taught on these commandments there in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. You know, then Jesus at the end, don't covet. Don't cover your neighbor's wife, his children, his slaves, his servants, his donkeys. You know, and 21st century, don't covet your neighbor's flat screen TV or smartphone or car or clothes or house. Again, it's the attitude of the heart. As Gia says, and we've, we've said this several times, you know, it revolves all down to two commandments. And I need to look some of my notes up here. So for us, what do these commandments mean? We're getting ready to roll into the Lord's Supper today where we remember what Jesus did on the cross for our shed blood. But you see, God didn't give us the Ten Commandments. He doesn't want to leave us in the dark of knowing who He is and His heart. But He doesn't just want to give us a list of do's and don'ts. He wants a relationship. And see, this is the basic instructions before leaving earth, the Bible. And as we read God's Word, we encounter the living Word. But the Ten Commandments are not given to us so that we become legalists. But it's to know his heart's desire. And as I said this early, the first four commandments, it revolves around this. And this is my question for you and for me. Who is sitting on the throne of your heart? What takes greatest allegiance for you? My prayer is that it is the Lord Jesus. 
That's my heart and prayer for all of us. But is there anything in your life that is taking greater allegiance? And it could be good things. It could be church. It could be your spouse. It could be your children. It could be your, your work. It could be your boss. It could be money. It could be your free time. What is taking greatest allegiance in your heart? The first four commandments addresses that heart issue. And Jesus wants to be number one in your heart, in your mind. He wants your passions to revolve around him. That's his deep longing desire. The second question is this. With the other six commandments, our relationships, the relationships that we have, are they honoring other people? Is there any strife or conflict that you have with someone else where you need to go ask for forgiveness or maybe forgive? Is there a relationship that you have right now that's not God honoring? Is there anyone in your life who you're holding bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness? You loathe and you criticize. There's three verses that I want to close with. The first one is this. It's written by King David. And King David was a wretch. He was a murderer, an adulterer. He was a deceiver. And yet he was a man after God's own heart. And yet in Psalm 119, the biggest psalm in Scripture, starting in verse 9, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word, knowing God's word, hiding in our hearts and obeying it. I've sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commandments. I've treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Again, here's one of the most amazing things about the Lord Jesus. Too much of the time we put our focus on obeying or disobeying, obeying or disobeying. We will never measure up. But the great thing about Jesus is this. Jesus actually fulfilled all the commandments all the time his entire life. And because he did that, he fulfilled all the righteous requirements that God requires from us. He did it. And then as most of you know, and it's what we're getting ready to celebrate as we remember his death on the cross, he then shed his blood on the cross so that we don't have to fulfill all those requirements because it's impossible for us to fulfill those requirements. It's impossible to obey the Ten Commandments. We can't do it on our own. But Jesus has done it for us, and this is the good news. He's done it for us, and then he paid the price for our sin and disobedience, and then he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we don't have to focus on a list of do's and don'ts. We can focus solely on loving God back and giving everything we are back to him in worship and in praise and a personal relationship because of Jesus. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And because we love God, we will naturally obey him. And we can only do that because of God's presence in our life through the power and presence of Holy Spirit. It's a joyous thing. And then with our relationships with others, Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourself. Everyone should look not only to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. When we know who we are in Jesus, when we know that he's loved us and has forgiven us completely, and we don't have to perform first for him nor for others, we can naturally look to the interests of others and serve other people, love other people. And through the power of Holy Spirit, we will fulfill those six commandments, but it comes from the heart of love. It's because Jesus rules and reigns in our hearts. Hutch, I want to ask you to come forward to play the piano. There's so many questions I'd love to ask you, I'd love to ask me, but we need to transition into this time of the Lord's Supper. But I do have some questions I want to ask, and they will not be up on the screen. I kind of alluded to this question earlier, but the first one is, does the Lord have the first priority in your life? 
Is he your first love? Is he my first love? If he's not, make him number one in your life today. Surrender whatever is in the way. Whatever is sitting on the throne of your heart that's not Jesus, take it off and lay it at his feet. Give it to him. The second one, and it's very similar, but sometimes we do love Jesus, but we have other allegiances. What other allegiances in your life are a stumbling block for you that are keeping you from loving Jesus and following him and serving him? Hard attitudes, the way you use your time, your money, your talents, your treasures. And I'm not asking these questions to put guilt trip on you. It's a challenge for all of us, but this is the perfect opportunity to lay it at Jesus' feet and then to commit to him. You know, Romans 12 says, in view or in light of God's mercy, present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. So I want to invite the deacons to come forward and I want to invite everybody else to stand up And just as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, I want us to take this time right now to really set our hearts right before the Lord, to give everything up to Him. As you'll see in the liturgy, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Let's take a few moments just confessing to the Lord. You don't have to promise him anything. Just come before him and bow at his feet and worship. Let's pray.